Hello once again, dear learners. We've looked at evolution thus far, natural selection, speciation, punctuated equilibrium, Lamarck Darwinism. And today we're gonna to be looking at human evolution. Before I begin human evolution, I just wanna read through this and make clear a particular concept that we saw in the last video. So it says so far in this chapter, you have seen that as a result of natural selection, the characteristics of organisms can change over time due to changing environmental conditions. And we saw that if there's a change in the environment, those with favorable characteristics would be able to cope with the change and they survive, that those that do not have the favorable characteristics will not be able to cope with the change and die. And those with the favorable characteristics will pass their favorable alleles to their offspring such that many more organisms will have the favorable characteristic as time goes on. But very importantly, they say here, new species can arise when a group of organisms change so much that they can no longer reproduce with the original species. This is called speciation. So once again, I repeat, new species can arise when a group of organisms change so much that they can no longer reproduce with the original species. Now, when new species is formed, it is called speciation. Now, let's go back to the last video. And one of the questions that was asked is that, how can you make out that two different populations belong to the same species? So if I had to draw this for you, my darlings, just in case you had, mm -hmm, Okay, just in case you had a group of organisms here, and then you had a very similar group of organisms here. So if I'm writing, I wish this would allow me to write. Okay, if I'm writing here, so this is population A. Okay, and then of course, this would be population B. Now, if I have two different populations, very similar in their characteristics, you know, so if this one, if this group look like foxes, these also look like foxes. How can you be sure that these two belong to the same species? So what you will do is that you will allow these to interbreed with each other. Sorry, my darlings. You'll allow these to interbreed with each other. So you put them together and you allow them to interbreed. Now, some texts are saying that they will not be able to interbreed because of barriers, reproductive barriers. For example, this may be reproducing now in March and these breed in June. So if they have different breeding times, they are unlikely to breed with each other. Or if they have developed different courtship behavior, then they're unlikely to breed with each other. That's if they are two different species. So if you put them together, let's see what is the definition of species to be able to work out how you make out whether they belong to the same species. Of course, if you can remember this fantastic mnemonic, SIVF, that means they have similar characteristics. Organisms of the same species have similar characteristics, means they look alike in many ways, not in a few ways. And they're able to interbreed, not only interbreed, to produce what, my darlings, viable and fertile offspring. So these become the determining factors to find out what becomes the determining factors, my darlings, producing viable and fertile offspring. So they, got, they are similar. So that is why we wanted to check whether they're the same species. But they must be able to interbreed to produce viable and fertile offspring. 
So if they cannot produce viable and fertile offspring, means population A is one species and population B is a different species. Are you with me? So you allow them to interbreed and you check their offspring. Offspring means what are the papas that they have. And if the offspring are not, are not viable, viable means they're able to grow and develop towards becoming a successful adult. And fertile, they must be able to reproduce, to produce more offspring. So you allow them to reproduce and check whether their offspring are able to produce fertile offspring themselves. If their offspring, their papas, once they become adults, are able to produce fertile offspring, then you know population A and population B belong to the same species. If you find that you allow them to interbreed and their offspring, when they grow to be adults, cannot produce fertile offspring. In other words, they are infertile. That means population A and population B are two different species, even though they look alike. They two different species. So the definitive thing is allowing them to interbreed to check whether their offspring are fertile. A typical example here, my darlings, is when we, I thought it was very cruel, when humans bred horses, isn't that so? When humans bred horses with, what did they breed them with? To produce animals that are pretty fast, and can carry heavy load. They bred horses with donkeys. You know, they allowed them to interbreed, my darlings. They allowed them to interbreed. Sorry. This is not tending to move. Let me see what's happening. Okay, there we go. I'll get back to them. And what they produced was a mule. Now, this mule, sadly, my babies, cannot have babies. The mule cannot have babies because the mules are infertile. They infertile. So they bred an animal that is now an infertile animal. It's actually a hybrid because it's a cross between two different species. So how would we know horses and donkeys are two different species? They produced a new that is infertile. Okay, so the definitive thing in finding out where the two populations belong to the same species is that you allow them to interbreed and check whether their offspring are fertile. If their offspring are fertile, means they are the same species. If they are not fertile, means they belong to different species. Is that clear? Okay, with that at the back of your mind, Let's look at now human evolution. And we are, and you will notice here, sorry, they say, sorry, I'm having difficulty here. There we go. They say over here, my babies, that natural selection and speciation can also be used to explain how humans have evolved. So you had, if you've been doing some reading, etc., you had like, Ape-like, human-like, you know, they were like in between apes and humans, looking more like humans than apes. And there was no way that modern humans could have mated with them because they were two different species. All right. So scientists identify trends in human evolution by comparing humans to other primates in terms of similarities and differences. The differences point to existence of different species, while the similarities point to a possible common ancestor. So if you look here, Papas, if we're going to be checking out the organisms of the, that are primates, all right, similarities between humans and African apes. Sorry, let me get this clear. Okay, so very importantly, we came across the word primates. No, primates. So what is actually primates? 
you know, what is classified into primates and how do we get the term primates? Where does it spring from? Remember, all organisms are classified as follows, you know. I teach children to remember. Of course, you don't have to remember it for this exam, but King Peter, kingdom, King Peter Phylum, mm -hmm. came over, came is class, over is order, four is family, gravy, is genus and socus those of you who are indian would know that gravy socus are potatoes is species so this these this is how organisms are classified you know what kingdom do they belong to what phylum what class what order what family what genus what species okay so for example if we take us you know if we take us we belong to kingdom Animalia. We are all animals, darling, so don't be offended if someone calls you an animal, okay? We belong to kingdom Animalia, sorry, and you would have learned, ah, you would have learned last year in grade 11 that you belong to the phylum Chordata. You've got a vertebral column and you've got that spinal cord coming through. You belong to the class mammals. You are all mammals, isn't it so? Mm -hmm. You belong to the order now, if you can remember primates. So primates, my darlings, is the name of the order. So what order do we belong to? Primates. What family do we belong to? Don't give me your family name. Hominidae, we belong to that family. Okay, and if we take humans, we belong to the genus Homo, and our species name is always written in small letters, Sapien. So we belong to the genus Homo and the species Sapien. So we are known as Homo Sapien, isn't it? So my darling, actually we write Homo, not like that. That's how we write Homo Sapien. Are you with me? So Order is primates. So if we're looking at the similarities between humans and African apes, so what are we looking at? We're looking at the similarities between organisms that belong to the same order. In other words, apes are primates, we are primates. Okay? But when you look at it in the final analysis, we're so different from them. Isn't that so? We're so different from apes. But we got to be similar, darlings. We got to be similar because we're belonging to the same primate, the same order. So what we're looking at, darlings, is the similarities between us and African apes in the first part of the study for human evolution. Okay, so let's look at it and I'll teach you easy ways to remember this. Good. So if you look at this diagram here, if you look at this diagram here, it's a beautiful diagram. There are certain things which are missing from it. And of course, don't learn it as it is shown over here. You'd be in big trouble. Okay, my babies. So let's look at it, my darlings. The first thing to say we have a large brain is wrong. I mean, we and apes have a large brain is wrong. If you just say we have a large brain, Technically, you'd be incorrect. We should say large brain compared to our body mass. No, because an elephant has got a large brain. But compared to its body mass, babies, its brain is relatively small. So both us humans and African apes, why are we comparing them? Because we have a common ancestor. Okay, that's why we're comparing them. Why are we comparing them? We belong to the order primates. We're going to see how similar we are, but also at the same time, how different we are. So we got a large brain compared to our body mass. So one thing about the brain. There are two other things about the brain. You would notice us as humans, we've got poor smell, isn't that so? So our olfactory centers, olfactory centers, 
are poorly developed. We and the apes, Papa. We and the chimpanzees. So we can't smell well. If we take us compared to a dog, we would never be able to smell as well as them. We don't want to compare to the shark because shark has got brilliant sense of smell. And then the centers for hand-eye coordination, you know, for hand and eye coordination. What on earth does this mean? You know, what on earth does this mean? Are well developed. Have you ever watched a monkey eating a banana? Does it look very similar to you? Yes, the monkey actually peels the banana. Means the information from his hands and eyes are transmitted very efficiently to that part of the brain that coordinates movement. Are you with me? And you have very precise movement that comes from peeling the banana knowing how to peel it, using your hands, and also using your eyes at the same time. So centers in the brain, where? Centers in your brain. Olfactory centers, where? In your brain, okay? So one, two, three things about the brain. Large brain compared to our body mass. Olfactory centers are poorly developed in our brain. Centers for hand and eye coordination are well developed. Then the thing about eyes, eyes in the front means you've got binocular vision. Eyes in the front is okay, but to say that we have binocular vision is being more scientific. In other words, you're looking at things with both your eyes because both your eyes are in the front. You know? As compared to the animals which have got the animals and which have got their eyes to the sides. Okay? Have you looked at a cow and is looking at you with both its eyes? No, Papas, because both its eyes are not in the front. So not only do we have binocular vision, we have what is also called stereoscopic vision. What on earth is that? You know, stereoscopic vision is what we call depth perception, where you're looking at something and you know exactly what is the location of something. Are you with me? Not only the location of something, you can see it in three dimension. All right because you're looking at it with both your eyes. So binocular vision and stereoscopic vision somewhere go together. So how many things we know about the upper part of the body, large brain compared to our body mass, binocular and stereoscopic vision because our eyes in the front. All factory centers in our brain are poorly developed and the centers in our brain for hand and eye coordination are well developed, okay? Now let's go to your arms. One, two, three, four, five. There are five things about your arms. Freely rotating arms while you were sitting listening to me. Just rotate your arms and give yourself some exercise. Swing your arms in the air. Freely rotating arms. That's because we have ball and socket joints that we learned about in grade 10, isn't that so? We also got long upper arms. Okay, and you'll notice as you're going and you're seeing the trend in human evolution, we move from very long upper arms to arms which are not very long. But basically we and apes have got long upper arms. Right? We have rotation around our elbow joint, you know, to give us greater flexibility. Okay? Bare fingertips or nails instead of claws. We don't have claws, we got nails, both us and the apes, and we got an opposable thumb. So whilst you're looking at me or listening to me, just place your hands in front of you. Remember the entire thing is your arm, the, the part to which your fingers are attached, your palm and your fingers, those are your hands. So don't confuse this. If you're looking at your hands, my darlings, your thumb is in a completely different direction compared to your four fingers. That is called an opposable thumb, opposite to your fingers. Of course, this opposable thumb gives you a lot of dexterity, skill with which you use your hands, like for example, peeling that banana. Opposable thumb. So, so the, the reason why that monkey can peel that banana as well, not be, only because the centers in his brain are well developed for hand-eye coordination, but also because he, like us, has got an opposable thumb. You wouldn't find your dog doing something like that, isn't that so, babies? So, 
We've got four about that, five about this. The other thing is that what they also mention about the um, hands is that we have got pentadactyl hands, you know, means we've got five digits, five digits attached to our palm of our hand, five. So we've got four fingers and our thumb, for example, penta, penta, not penda, penta, oh, goodness, my darlings, pentadactyl, hmm? pentadactyl hands, we've got five digits, all right. So, so many things, four there, actually six there, ten we know so far. Another thing, my darlings, is what is not mentioned in this diagram, and if I could just draw it, is that, of course, we have two mammary glands, females especially here, two mammary glands that's associated with being, with having, belonging to the order primates, two mammary glands, quite graphic, isn't that so? So try and capture this all into your head before I proceed to the last two. Okay. One, two, three. Let me take this off so it'll allow me to go down to the bottom. All right, darlings. And the other two is upright posture. We can assume an upright posture, although apes may not be upright all the time, but they have the ability of assuming an upright posture and being comfortable, if not for a long period of time, but comfortable for a short period of time. And one more that is missing here, let me get my box again, is that we have, yep, just like the apes, we have few offspring. Of course, that allows us our parental care as well. Hmm? we have few offspring. You don't find like apes having 10 puppas at one time. Good. So those are the similarities between your apes, between the apes, sorry, and us, between the Okay, darlings. Between humans and your African apes, all right. So there we go, similarities between humans and African apes. So although we are so similar, honeys, just look at how different we are. And of course here, we gotta be very specific when we're doing this here. We cannot play around with this because this is asked of us very, very often. So let me make it as big as I can possibly, as I possibly can. So the first difference is that, remember the first similarity was that we both have a large brain compared to our body mass. But if you compare humans to African apes, we've got a large cranium, they've got a small cranium. Cranium is that part of the skull that houses the brain. So you can either say large cranium, small cranium, or large brain, small brain. You can't say them as two differences, okay? Brow ridges, brow ridges is that part of the skull on top of which you got your eyebrows. So if you feel your eyebrows, they're somewhat flat. So our brow ridges are not well developed. While at African apes, they have a very well developed brow ridge, which gives them that African-like look because, because their brow ridges are so pronounced, their eyes are somewhat sunk, no? So let's do all with the papas. Let's do all with, mm -hmm, with the, skull, so cranium, brow ridges, canines. We've got small canines, they've got large canines. And the difference between this you'll realize is that we eat cooked food, which is soft. They eat raw food, which is harder and more difficult to chew. Hmm? Our palate shape, what is our palate? Palate is that part of the skull to which your teeth are attached. So if you take your finger of course, your teeth must be brushed. And feel your teeth. Your teeth are arranged in a semicircular pattern because our palate is semicircular. At the same time, we've got a small palate just because our jaws are small teeth, small jaws as well. So theirs are long and rectangular. Hmm? 
And if we're looking at our jaws, we've got small jaws and less protruding jaws. Protruding jaws means like almost, almost like your, your lower jaw comes right out in front of you, like you can almost see your lower jaw. You know, some texts say we got less protruding jaws or less prognathous jaws, or some say we, our jaws are not prognathous at all. Hmm? While with the African apes, they got large jaws hmm? and, or they, and they are more prognathous. Then on top of your skull, my darlings, on top of your skull, in the apes, you have like a bony protuberance or a bony projection. That is called a cranial ridge, which allows for additional attachment of muscles. And here we got no cranial ridge with us. Otherwise, we'd all have a mohawk all the time, isn't it? So, so those of you who got a mohawk, you're actually making like you want to have a cranial ridge. Foramen magnum. What is foramen magnum? You learned when you did skeleton in grade 10. Foramen magnum is the opening at the base of the skull. Yeah, which allows the spinal cord to pass through. So, so with us, our foramen magnum is in a more forward position. Of course, that is related to us being, there's a word, to us being, yeah, let me write it here since it's closer there, bipedal. So because we walk with two legs, we walk with two legs, we don't walk with fours, we walk with two. By meaning two. It's only we're only able to do that and do that comfortably because our foramen magnum is in a more forward position, which allows our spinal cord to extend vertically down, straight down, because our vertebral column extends vertically. So because our foramen magnum is there, the spinal cord comes straight down. Mm -hmm. So our vertebral column extends vertically from your skull downwards which allows us to be bipedal. But then with the African apes, their foramen magnum is in a more full backward position. So they are not bipedal. What is the opposite of being bipedal, walking with four limbs is quadrupedal. So your apes are quad, quad referring to four, like the quad bikes, no? Four. Of course, they're supposed to have all four wheels in touch with the ground at all times. Hey. Quadrupedal, quad is four. Bipedal, two. So what allows us to be bipedal is our foramen magnum in a more forward position. And here your foramen magnum is in a more backward position. So those are all related to the skull. Now, oh, look at that, so many. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. You know, some texts also speak about here um, when it comes to the teeth in that we have got small spaces between our teeth, small and sometimes or no spaces between our teeth. No, small or no spaces between the teeth. And some texts speak about this here, my darling. Here with your apes, they have got large spaces between the teeth. Okay, it does not mean that if you've got large spaces between the teeth that you're more ape-like. No, you can remove your teeth or you can have a genetic predisposition where you've got spaces between your teeth, okay? Smaller, no spaces between the teeth, large spaces between the teeth. So, papas, so many things to remember about the skull. Of course, it can only come by you practicing and going through questions, all right? And we'll go to questions in the next video, but let's complete this entire thing about the differences between us and African apes. Spine, we have got a most curved spine. I like to say an S-shaped spine. Of course, this again, you did in grade 10 skeleton, S-shaped spine, all right? And of course, this is also linked to bipedalism. Hmm? And these guys have a C-shaped spine. And also linked to bipedalism, we got a short, wide, remember both these words, short, wide pelvis to bear the weight of the upper body. And these guys, because they're not bipedal all the time, they got a long, narrow pelvis. All right, this I'll show to you 
more clearly using diagrams. Just wait a bit while I just erase all of this. Okay, darlings. So let's look at these diagrams once again. This is that cranial ridge babies. Notice they got a cranial ridge in the African ape. They got a pronounced brow ridge. The canines are larger. Here you can't see, but they also got spaces. They've got a prognathous jaw. Their jaws are larger. Foramen magnum in a more backward position. Ours is in a more forward position. And the cranium size is smaller because normally nice to see something to compare with, isn't it? So because they got a small brain. Okay. This is their C-shape. doesn't look very C-shaped to me or to you, isn't it? So, Papa. So, they got a C-shaped spine associated with them being quadrupedal. We've got an S-shaped spine. Hmm? Okay. There we go. So, there's this. they can attempt to be bipedal or upright, but only for short periods. So, there's your S-shape, which is related to them being bipedal. Okay because this type of spine allows you to be upright and bear the weight of your upper body. One thing that they haven't shown you is that the type of your pelvic girdle. Here, your pelvic girdle, let me just draw it for you, babies. Here, your pelvic girdle would be with the ape. No. The pelvic girdle would be so much long. Oh, both of them would be equal sizes. But with us, our pelvic girdle tends to be short, you know, short and wide. Okay, theirs is long axis, long and narrow. I hope that has been made clear to you, darlings. And you'd be able to apply this knowledge. So look for some questions on these here. I'll also try to find some questions on this before I see you in the next video. So God bless you until we meet again, my dear darlings.